DeSanto Propane is four generations strong as a trustworthy family-owned business with unmatched customer service. Go online at DeSantoPropane.com for more info or call toll-free at 1-800-752-4574. Since 1937, the difference has been DeSanto Propane. Do you want to know what's happening in the Finger Lakes? We do, too. We're going in-depth with decision makers in the heart of upstate New York to get the answers you need. From the team of FingerLakes1.com, this is Inside the FLX. Today on Inside the FLX, we are talking about the workforce. So far this year, unemployment rates have hovered between 3.5 and 4% across the region. Ordinarily, that would be cause for celebration, but employers across the spectrum are voicing concerns. To get a lay of the land, discuss some data, and more, I was joined last week by Lynn Fried from Finger Lakes Works. We covered a lot of ground, but one major goal of the conversation was to get some perspective from someone working with employers to fill local jobs. Check it out. Lakes Works. <clears throat> Who are we? What do we do? That's a big question. Um, and, and I'm going to go into the big answer because that's how <laughs> it makes sense. Sure. So we have our U.S. Department of Labor. Okay, Those are our taxpayer dollars which come to the states, which is New York State Department of Labor. From there, via federal legislation, there are 33 local workforce areas. Ours is the Finger Lakes workforce area, which is four counties of Seneca, Yates, Ontario, and Wayne counties. So then our, that funding comes to us for our local area for workforce-related activities. So within that four counties, there are career centers. There are two in Ontario County, Geneva, and Hopewell. So at the career centers, community members can come in if they're interested in looking at a career. It can be a youth straight out of school. It could be somebody that's transitioning from one career to the next. We have different events that happen during our career journeys, whether we're laid off, whether there's a recession, whether there's a pandemic, things happen. And sometimes we want to readjust and look at what options and opportunities are. When somebody comes into a career center and they work with a counselor, when they're working with that in individual, there's a whole a uh, bunch of activities that happen uh, for the information that they're sharing. So what does that mean? At Finger Lakes Works, we work, we're uh, tasked with pulling together a board of private sector industry, as well as our local community organizations and agencies, resources, supports, education, higher education, to have all these conversations. By the time somebody from our communities is coming into a career center and they're working with a counselor, all of this information has, has come together. So what does that mean? So if somebody walks in and says, geez, you know what, I went through the pandemic, maybe they were in food service and they got sent home two or three times, and they said, you know, I want to look at a different career. Um, we, the board convenes and they talk about what are their needs, what do skills look like today to get into those jobs. Everything is set up to communicate back. It's a full, it really is a full circle to communicate back to our community members so that they have real-time live information. We're connected to the industries. They know the jobs that are open. They know the skills that are open. And all the partners are together to make sure that if somebody gets into training, they're getting the training for skills for a job career that's here locally. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, combing through some of the the website, of course, some of the connected materials uh, came across unemployment data. Obviously, you can get those monthly updates. Mm -hmm. um, unemployment, for the better part of you know, a year and a half or so, uh, has been historically low. I guess would be the way to the way to put it uh, here in the Finger Lakes. Um, what does workforce development look like when? Unemployment is between three and a half and say four and a quarter percent mm -hmm. versus what might have been standard between 2010 and 2019. Right. So that's where the Department of Labor tracks all of the data, tracks the trends locally. Part of our work is to track trends, what's happening in our own backyard within these counties. And then you shift and you move with it. So when unemployment numbers are known, you don't have people coming into the career centers. Uh, you have to understand where's the population that is able to work and willing to work um, and, and where you're going to, to satisfy the workforce coming in. So right now, with unemployment numbers being as low as they are, the traditional uh, pockets of, of people and just the sheer number is not there. Um, so a lot of focus right now is on youth. 
So K through 12, what conversations and what work can be done there to partner with schools, to connect to industry, to connect to higher education and other training providers and vendors to get the skills to get, again, whether it's a job or a career. Um, we're taking a lot higher look at youth going through K through 12, and especially when they're in high school. Uh, not everybody wants knows what they want to be when they grow up. So really that workforce journey uh, is starting to develop more robustly with youth. And again, you're working with your, your higher education partners, and that does not necessarily always mean a college. And part of the transformation that's ho happened over the last 10 or 15 years is we understood very quickly coming out of the 2007, 8, 9 recession that there was a greater need for entry level, get your foot in the door to a career to get that job. I use manufacturing. That's uh, a pretty one where we've seen technology has just outpaced education. And back in the Kodak days, you know, those days are gone where you can walk out of high school grad as a graduate, walk down the street to a Kodak, to a Xerox, to any of these places, and step in and get a job with a high school diploma. Um, today, you can't do that. You at least need some form of other sophist sophisticated, higher skill uh, training, even just for entry-level positions. Machines now are many more million dollars. They have a lot more higher sophisticated technology to be able to run them. So that part uh, started shifting and changing in 2007, 8, and 9. And what we found out was that even higher education hadn't kept up because technology was just outpacing it so far. We've had a few conversations with uh, K-12 through administrators over the last three or four months or so. Uh, and pretty much all of them agree that there are going to be some pretty big changes to K through 12, especially at the latter end of that high school over the next five, six, seven years. Um, in particular, uh, looking more like there's going to be pathways uh, to graduation, different uh, scenarios where students can specialize a little more, perhaps get some training in specific uh, niche areas. When uh, you folks in the workforce development side of things are thinking about those kinds of changes uh, and how impactful that could be in a region like the Finger Lakes uh, in terms of not just uh, creating the next generation of workforce here that, that businesses can choose from, also reinforcing and, and building that population back a little bit. How, how positive would some uh, structural changes in the K through 12 environment, how far would some of those changes go if they did come to fruition over the next, you know, five, seven, eight years? It would be tremendous. It's all about uh, partnerships, relationships, and making that connectivity for the youth. Again, not everybody knows who they want to be when they grow up. Uh, so there's many layers and levels to that. Having the opportunity for events, activities, coordination, communication uh, between K through 12, especially high schoolers as they're getting ready to have tours to go and visit a different different employers, different industries. What is this truly about? A lot of times people think they want to get into healthcare and then they realize it's blood and, and potentially adult <laughs> uh, diaper changing and then they have a change of mind. But there's yeah. still so many careers in healthcare. And healthcare has gotten so much more diverse. We're used to hearing about doctors and nurses, you know, but now there's surgical technicians and, and it's really endless because of the special, specialization. And again, technology is constantly changing. So any of the opportunities for anybody who's young, even just to start sowing those seeds, take a tour, understand what it means, you know, the day, you know, in the life of a nurse, uh, of a manufacturer, a machinist, uh, IT, cybersecurity, um, all these different careers, any opportunity that there is to just start seeing that. Um, jobs and careers, again, have changed so much that just saying to be a manufacturer, to be in the career uh, skilled trades, even technology is shifting and changing there. Farm food and egg, which is huge in our area. A lot of that is automized and roboted, um, robotics now that are involved in part of that. So it looks very, very different. In manufacturing, they say, you know, it's not your grandfather's, you know, dirty manufacturing factory anymore. A lot of it is clean. It is sleek. It is super computerized. And it requires different education and different skills. So that connection and that communication happening between the school's primary education uh, and then again, higher education has changed in that maybe you don't need a, a degree to, to be a machinist. Maybe you just need a six-month training program. Yeah. Um, same thing for healthcare. There's a lot of different credentials and licensures that don't necessarily require that degree program. And that conversation is coming up. Um, 
career and building skills, building trades, uh, apprenticeship programs are coming back with full vim and vigor right now. And it's great. They were great training programs back in the day. Uh, things shifted and changed for a while, but they're coming back very strong. And New York State is supporting that uh, straight from the governor's office, from the Department of Labor, from the SUNY college system. So there's a lot of support there for these other alternative, what we used to feel was non-traditional training pathways. Yeah. Do you, do you think there's a scenario where, uh, you know, we could get back to a point where students walking across collecting their, their high school diploma are able to more quickly transition into, like you mentioned, some of the training programs that exist now. Um, a six to 12 month timeline is one thing, but to potentially have some of that basic uh, training, so to speak, knocked out when the student is a senior in high school so that they can in June or July, uh, you know, after graduation, get right into the workforce to, you know, you think about trying to prevent, uh, or you, you would hope, uh, preventing some of those folks from finding opportunities further away to perhaps keep some of them here. Yeah. Um, yes. And those are at the beginning stages of actually coming to fruition now. So uh, in that partnership and communication with K through 12, 11th and 12th grade, they can take a look at curriculum uh, for students. And if they're positive, they, they want to take that pathway and they want to take that uh, career trajectory into healthcare. There are programs that they can start taking, classes, coursework that they can start taking. There are co-ops, internships, uh, depending on which specific track that they're on, that they can start uh, shadowing and getting clinical time in. So that by the time, again, depending on which trajectory, which pathway that you're looking at, um, to be employable by the time you graduate, it is possible. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, the industries that you, you are dealing with on a regular basis. Um, when you look at the region, what are the industries in greatest need right now? And then the, the second piece of that is going to be, what are the skills that they're looking for? Like, is, are they hard skills, soft skills? Like what combination is it? What, what is the workforce lacking from those industries and those folks you guys talk to? You're going to get me in trouble with my board with that first question. <laughs> uh, if the trucking industry, who is represented on the board, were here, they would say, of course, truckers. You know, we need mm -hmm. truckers. Of course, that's the greatest need. Healthcare is in a crisis. I think they get to, they get to have spot number one because uh, that is still in crisis post-pandemic. Uh, manufacturing is still ha holding in there strong. Anything IT-related, AI, is, is burgeoning and growing. And we are a heavy agricultural region, so anything with our food, farm, eggs. Uh, our, I can't forget our, our labor unions and skilled trades and construction. Uh, we all know that when something breaks at home and we need to call someone, it's like, oh, geez, how long do we have to wait <laughs> until their schedule opens up, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know of an industry that's currently declining uh, without saying pretty much all of it. And, and again, this goes back to um, where's that workforce? When unemployment numbers are low, we don't have the pipeline of people coming in. So that impacts all industries across. I can't forget retail. I can't uh, forget food and tourism, which is also very significant here. The wine industry, all of it. Everyone's feeling the impact of that. Question number two. The skills. Like what are the, what is, are there common skills across industries that are, that are lacking, that require some, some help? Perhaps are, are there some other skills that are more common now than maybe were 10 or 15 years ago? What, what's the skills breakdown look yeah. like? So the skills that employers want to see across industries where it doesn't matter what the actual industry cluster sector is. It used to be called soft skills. Now we're calling them personal and professional skills. So this is show to up to work on time, show up appropriately dressed, uh, <clears throat> communication within the workplace. So that's been something that's that's been on the horizon um, for the 20, 20 plus years that I've been in workforce development. But it's moved away from soft skills to, to more um, personal and professional development. And part of the reason for that goes back to, back to technology increasing at the rate that it has. So maybe back in the day, uh, if you're out on the manufacturing floor, if auditors are coming by, if you have contracts with the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, whatever the case, medical, healthcare field, whatever it may be, um, everything is regulated heavily now. Um, so if someone's coming in and they're going through an audit or a monitoring process, they may have to talk to somebody who's actually touching the equipment and working at that might have become it. 
those skills are more sophisticated. That level of communication is more sophisticated because of technology than it's ever been. There's training often where it's including personal and professional skills. Every industry will tell you they want to see that. Anytime anyone's showing up, there's wonderful conversations going on right now because of the many diverse generational uh, people that we have in the workforce. There are still significant boomers. Then you've got the Gen X. Then you've got the millennials. Now you've got the Gen Z. Um, we would think sometimes it's almost different languages when they're talking. <laughs> All of those <laughs> levels of communication mm -hmm. and correspondence. I don't know if anybody watches Champagne Cruise. It's literally my favorite thing to watch. <laughs> he does a fantastic job. And we literally, because we have all the generations in our very small office. Um, but just to have that reflective moment of how, you know, we're presenting ourselves throughout the generations. And it comes up in the workforce conversations. Um, everyone's very, very aware. All employers through all industries are very aware. Nobody wants anybody walking out the door without a significant conversation. How did we get here? Somebody's getting ready to walk out the door. Uh, did the employer do their due diligence? And did they have enough training? Did they have enough opportunity uh, to have the hands-on part? Uh, was there somebody there maybe to mentor or coach? Employers of all industries are looking at these tools and building them in. 20 years ago when I started in workforce, I literally used to have employers say, just need a warm body to stand here and push buttons. Nobody says that anymore. Not only from the employer perspective, but us as, as you know, the, the employed. We want to feel connected. We want to feel that we're going someplace and, and there's an exchange there of, of good, you know, goodwill all the way around. We want to feel important. We want to feel valued. We want to feel listened to. So all of that is coming up more and more. We talk about who is the good employer? And a lot of these things are in there. And it's not just about dollars and cents anymore. It's about benefits. It's about flexibility. The pandemic changed everything when we talk about flexibility. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk about remote work. And I'm kind of curious how remote work presents itself in what you guys are doing in the businesses you guys are working with in the communities you're working with, because obviously, uh, you know, Ontario County is probably more like Monroe County, but Yates County is nothing like either of those. Um, so when you're thinking about the businesses and talking with the folks, uh, the employers in those communities, and even the workers, um, where does the remote work element come into that? Like how, how part and parcel is it? Mm -hmm. to it. So there's two label, layers to that. <clears throat> if you're in healthcare and you're, you're actually taking care of people, you actually have to be there. Yeah. Manufacturing, you actually have to drive that truck, get in the truck and drive it. So there's certain areas where it's no question at all. It's a, it's a show up and be present and do your job because it's a physical place and you have to be there. Now, within healthcare and manufacturing and all these other places, there are offices, there are engineers, there are other. And then there's the pandemic, which is a significant player in this as well. Um, there's been a lot of flexibility in, in, and innovation and adaption, adoption um, when it's come to remote work. Um, employers got really, really creative during the pandemic. If childcare was decimated and closed down, uh, uh, elder care, nursing homes was decimated and closed down, families needed to make life depending decisions very quickly. Um, and employers moved with them and they became just as creative. So if that meant sh uh, changing to shift work so that if you have to be on site, the flexibility to be at home when one partner's home and can take care of mom and dad and or kids. And this is where the, the remote question came up. If it can be remote, can you work at home? And then that shifted really hard and fast and we did not fall down and we did not fall apart, regardless of what industry that you were in. Was it perfect? No. And people have started to come forward. It's been interesting. It was like, this is great. Everyone wants to work at home. Um, but people started to come forward and, and say, some people said, you know what? I like working remote maybe once or twice a week, but I really miss the water cooler conversations. I miss the interactivity. I actually need to be in the office. Some people say, you know, when it's my partner's term to time to watch the kids, I need to get the heck out of the house and I need to be at the office. So there's a lot of different dynamics that have changed. A lot of that came from a forced need of flexibility in order to keep the workforce that could still work while they had other things to do that were happening during that pandemic. As we started to come out of the pandemic, the questions were asked, oh, we did that okay. Part of this was okay. And people learned very quickly if they can work remote, what other jobs are out there? So there was all this shifting going on. So if I can do my job from home, maybe I can look at other jobs that are remote. 
uh, and work from home. So there's a lot of shifting and changing that's been there. Um, I think employers, um, some of them have very concrete, you know, there's X amount of days, X amount of time that you can work from home. The rest of the time you have to be in the office. Uh, others are just really flexible based on the needs of, of individuals. The pandemic impacted not only the individual working, but it it impacted based on the people of their lives. If they had somebody that was uh, healthcare sensitive at home or part of their life, that's impacting the individual that's working and maybe working in settings where um, they need to be aware of who they're, the people of their lives, not just themselves in the work situation. Yeah. Um, In-person uh, work still harder to recruit for, for most, from what you guys are saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do. New York State conducts two different surveys every year. One of them is for employers. One of them is for working families, job seekers. The job seeker working family one always comes back. People are looking for that flexibility and that remoteness. There is a little bit of a disconnect there, but time's going on, and the the it was so novel at the time because of the pandemic. Everybody was forced home unless you were healthcare. Um, and then as they came back, and then I think people don't necessarily always want to be home or remote the whole time. There is a connectivity of you're my coworker. I want to interface. And people realize as time goes on, the in-person work conversation, networking that can be done and achieved because you are in person, there's a value to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you think about where the workforce in the Finger Lakes is right now and kind of put you on the spot, if you're going to give it a grade, what, what would that grade be today versus, let's say, a decade ago? So when you say, what is the workforce? The quality of the workforce today, because I, th I think for most people listening, um, they're going to think about the, the reports about population decline. Mm -hmm. Communities declining, school enrollment K through 12 declining significantly. Mm -hmm. um, pandemic obviously mm -hmm. accelerated some of this, um, but a lot of these things had already uh, already been in motion. Um, so I think there's an assumption, and I don't necessarily know if it's right or wrong, mm -hmm. that the quality of the workforce must be worse, mm -hmm. must, must be poorer now, right? Mm -hmm. um, true, not true, somewhere in the middle. What what does it look like today from your from your vantage point versus you know, 10 years ago, or perhaps the, the start of your career when you first got into workforce development? Yeah, that's a really, really dynamic question. And I think it's a little bit of everything, and I'm not trying to shortchange it. There is good quality work for everyone. I think what we're doing better as a system, as a culture, hopefully, uh, you know, from a humanitarian piece, is we're starting to recognize, uh, they get called different uh, different terms, but sometimes it's called special populations. So if you're an individual with a disability and there might be a capacity to your skills, a level quality of work, right? Um, but working with individuals to ensure that they get the training to be the most effective and use the best of their capacity. And there's, depending on what that is, there's a true value to that. The other thing that we learned during the pandemic when everyone, you know, kind of, oh, that's a low skills position. Well, when you're in a hospital and you need the environmental team to come through and clean and, and do all that, all of a sudden they, they ranked really high and they beat that skill and the recognition for that. We see it every single time something breaks down in our household, the plumber, the electrician, you know, their value shifts and changes based on how readily available that they are. All of these job skills have gone through different lenses, I think, over different times. Um, so where's our workforce today versus where it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago? Technology has continually forced a higher base level of skills. So I'm going to go back to manufacturing. If you were in manufacturing and you were uh, whatever your position, you know, production assistant or uh, whatever it may be, you could have potentially had a decades long career. You're basically kind of doing the same thing. That was true decades ago. Over the last 20, 30, 40 years with this technology boost, it's really been shifting and changing. So we're not complaining anymore so much. Ten years ago, everyone was up in arms when we were talking about automation and robotics. It's taking jobs away from people. Well, we don't have enough people. So when that's happening, that's often the lower skilled stuff um, that you might need two or three people to do. But if you had 20 of them doing it, now you only need two or three people that are running the machines, running the automation. They have to have higher skills. 
they're getting paid a higher wage because they have better skills. So there's jobs for everyone at all skills levels, but ultimately technology continues to shift and change in order to keep up with that. Everyone needs additional training, higher training, which typically equates to higher wages. What's tougher right now in the Finger Lakes? Uh, connecting with young people who haven't yet entered the workforce uh, and finding what's right for them, mm-hmm. or connecting with older folks who maybe have been in the workforce for 10, 15, 20, maybe 25 or 30 years, but still need another 10 or so years before they can think about retiring and trying to get the right skills to those individuals to match them up with opportunities in the region, given all that change you just described. Which of those two is is more of a challenge from what you guys are seeing on on the day-to-day? I think what's more of a challenge is the youth population. Um, Because things have changed so quickly, as we're older, regardless of what you've had, even if you're changing a, a total career trajectory, um, you have experience. You know what it means to work. You know what it means to show up. You know what it means to communicate, relate. And even if you're changing skills, there's a lot of transferable stuff that comes there. When folks are coming through the career center offices, they usually have some sort of idea, hey, I've been doing this and whatever the reason may be that caused the change. Now they want to look at this. They have some of that self-motivation direction, at least usually have some sort of idea or if something's happened to them, that career counselor can say, hey, you know, maybe, you know, something has happened, whether it was medically an accident or something. So here are other options. Um, whereas I think with youth, there's there's very interesting and dynamic uh, uh, conversations there. Youth are so fast and so quick at certain technology. Um, I mean, you know, my grandchildren can pick up my cell phone and do all sorts of things and get it attached. All, whereas I, you know, every time there's an upgrade or an update at work on Microsoft, I'm like, oh, God, I have to sit down. And it takes me time. I, it is not intuitive for me. I am upset that I have to run Excel differently than how I've learned it for decades. So I have that moment. Youth go, this is great. This is cool. Let, look at this go. Now we can do this, this, and this. Uh, so I think somehow, and sometimes it's bridging that gap. And then again, it goes back to the awareness. There are so many different job titles, job descriptions, and skills that go with that. We're constantly hearing about it in the workforce offices from healthcare, from, from all of them. Well, we, now we have a position for this because they came up with this widget gadget that's higher technology. We have to come up with a training program for it, and they're already building the equipment to do that. So making sure that youth are aware of, of and keeping them abreast of all the, you know, it's not just a doctor or a nurse or manufacturing, you know, or carpenter. Um, within all of those industries, there's so many other layers of careers that can that can spider web out in any different direction. I think that part's exciting. I think that's the challenge for all of us now is keeping up with that, getting that information to the youth, especially 11th and 12th grade, so they can start going, hey, geez, you know what? This sounds really cool. And then what are the connections they can, uh, they can make? I'll talk a little tiny bit about Victor High School. They recently um, hired a work ba- uh, work-based learning coordinator. Other schools have them too. It's so exciting. That individual just works with kids. Hey, you know what? I I think, you know, I want to make medical equipment. So they can do a co-op, an internship, a job shadow for a couple of weeks and and while they're still in school and say, that was great and I want to explore that more. Or they can walk in and go, you know, it smelled really funny. I don't think I can handle the smell. Uh, Who knows? You don't know that until you, you have that opportunity to step into there. So I think those connections, because... Nothing is what it was before. When you say doctor, is it a specialist? Is it a GP? GP is like, you know, GPs used to be all there was before. But now everything is so specialized, regardless of what industry that you're in. They have drones and, and ag- you know, like, I don't know, be on a farm. What do I want to do on a farm? Well, you know, you want to drive the drones? Because okay. you don't have people walking up and down the crops anymore to check for disease, to check for animals coming in. And you're driving drones, and then you're looking at drones, and it's all computerized, and it's all the gadgets and that, and that's exciting and new. So the awareness piece and the specific training that needs to go with that. Curious about this. Um, anecdotally, we've heard over the last year, two years, especially in the, the customer service side of things, um, that there are less kids working, less young people working uh, in high school and in college than in years past. Um, you know, I'm, I've been out of I've been out of high school or out of school in general for you know the 12, 14 years. Um, Everybody worked, or it seemed like most everybody worked when I was in high school. 
Um, that seems not to be the case now, especially as we talk to parents and, and people who own small businesses. Um, fewer people working in customer service at that young, impressionable age. Um, is that just anecdotal nonsense or has there been some kind of actual change in the workforce over the last like 10 to 15 years that has actually like made that happen? So the MZ report, E-M-S-I, I know the acronym, but I don't know the words. Uh, <clears throat> the report from 2021, which is dated now, but it has a, a lot of great information about workforce impacts. So that leads directly to the boomer generation. The boomer generation, number one, there were so many boomers that they changed the face of workforce at the time because it was flush with people and employers could take their pick. Who was the best trained? Who had the best? So that competitiveness was more on I want to be employed as opposed to now it's kind of changed. It's almost reversed. And who's the best employer? So instead of the employer saying, who, you know, who am I going to pick who's going to be the best for me as the employer, it's reversed. And the employers are saying, who's the best employer? And individuals are saying, why, do, why would I want to work for you? That ties, so that was part of what the boomer change did there. And then fast forward is the population is starting to decline. Boomers were also very, very successful in creating good wealth for themselves and for their families. So as their children started to grow up and it crossed over a little bit into Gen X. So they've been very successful at creating good family wealth for themselves and for their families. So back in the day, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. So babysitting counted too before I was of age to get sure. the, the regular job and mowing lawns. Um, so not all kids had to work. Because there was enough wealth in, in the family home that if they were really just focusing on sports and school, they could do that. So maybe they had to work and maybe they didn't. That is in the report as a data point and was impactful and is impactful. Interesting. So actually it's reverse, I guess, then of what a lot of people think it is. More kids are working now than in years past. No, I think it's reversed okay. because the boomers were so successful in generating wealth for the family. I got you. You right, know, right. like a lot of like you know if I wanted to, you know, I could take my parents' car to go and do something, but I had sure. to pay for the gas money to put in it. So I had a job working at McDonald's babysitting. I it did whatever I did cuz I wanted to drive that car right. where course. I wanted to go. Um it, but I, I do want to go back to the change from, you know, why did it go from people who wanted to be employed, who wanted to get a job, you know, having to be competitive and I have to be the best and employers saying, who I'm going to get, you know, the best. And now that's flipped. Uh, prior to my position here, I worked for a state workforce organization called Workforce Development Institute. And I traveled to the Levin County area. I was in, I think it was either Genesee or Livingston County. I walked into a manufacturing employee, Liberty Pumps, and I walked into their staff room and it was like walking into... Wegmans, you know, you, there's the sub shop here, the pizza shop there, this here, and this is a staff break room and it's all beautifully decorated, beautiful, uh, furniture to sit in beautiful lighting. And I walked in and I said, wow, so this is great. And I, is this a heck of a staff room? And they said, yeah, they said, it's our goal to be, we hear about destination weddings. They said, we want to be an employer destination. I said, I've never heard that. What is it? And they said, we have no idea, but we're going to become one. <laughs> But that thought process, we are going to be an employer destination. People are going to travel to us and come here because they want to work for us. That's a whole philosophy shift and change. And they're not the only ones doing it. Is that when you talk to employers, um, you don't have to name names, but is that a bit of a, has that been a bit of a challenge? Has that transition been a bit of a challenge for some? Uh, you know, employer, a private sector is going to do what they need to do. You know, uh, everybody wants good talent. Everyone wants good skilled talent. Um, so I think it's just been a natural evolution. It, it changed. There was a plethora of people that you could train, get in. Whatever, there was no need. That need wasn't there. And it shifted and changed. And people said, well, do I want to work here or do I want to work there? And when you're walking into a staff room, you know, that has four or five different options and, and there's a lot of other flex. It goes back to what we were saying before, somewhere it shifted dollars and benefits weren't the only consideration of am I choosing to work for this employer or this employer. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get your, your thoughts on a couple bigger picture items here before we wrap up. Um, Micron, it's been a lot of talk, obviously, in central New York. Um, central New York will experience the the biggest positives to come from that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but 
talked to a lot of folks running for elected office last year, uh, and almost every single one of them mentioned Micron at least once and hoped their community would be some kind of beneficiary of the Micron development over the next 10 or so years. Um, realistically, uh, in your territory, in the Finger Lakes here, what, what, what should the expectations be or what could the expectations be and how are you guys preparing for that? Mm -hmm. So sure, we're having the same conversations too as the outlying areas. Uh, you know, Seneca County is on the eastern portion of our region. It's not unrealistic that somebody would choose to potentially uh, make that commute, especially if it's flexible and part of that uh, work design uh, package could be remote work, yeah. right? If you're in the in the office part of the time and you're working from home part of the time. Uh, so it is going to impact all outlying areas, uh, depending on with Micron, you know, as they start ramping up and as they start hiring uh, whatever those positions are, people shift and move, you yeah. know, um, there, it, we will be impacted. Yet everything's always yet to be seen. There's a schedule out for Micron, um, but there's all the, there's a lot of markers that have to happen, you know, during that time. Will it be significant, huge for us? The answer is in great big waves, no, because we do have a little bit of that travel space that's there. That said, it's such a tight labor market as it is that it will be impactful. Yeah. Um, a lot of folks have made the argument that the throughway basically is the solution to that distance you're talking mm -hmm. about, though. So, it, I mean, do, do, does it seem reasonable to think that the, the corridor on the western side out here could potentially benefit yep. from that? Absolutely. So, and then on federal and state levels, and I don't know all the acronyms, but I do know a couple of them. So, New York State has won a federal award, and that is for, it's for the I-90 corridor. Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, it goes straight across. Um, and it's for semiconductor, which is heavy for Rochester. Uh, so that all that infrastructure and planning is, is being set up there. And then uh, New York State also has other I-corridor type things. So all the infrastructure is being laid. And the throughway is, you know, it, it, it's, mass, it's mass transit for upstate New York. How do you level those expectations and keep that kind of um, – at arms reach, I guess, because it's where you guys are. Um, you, you don't have direct access to the, the Rochester development. You don't have direct access to the, the Syracuse area developments. Um, how do you keep that at bay and remain focused on the hyper-local stuff that is really part and parcel to the, to the everyday life in Ontario, Yates, Seneca, and, and counties like that. Mm -hmm. So people are going to shift and change again, just, just as we mentioned. They'll make the best decisions for themselves. Um, that said, uh, especially in the Finger Lakes area, we are very bolstered by um, uh, food, ag, and tourism. Um, so there are certain things that are nuancy and very specific to this region. Um, Ontario County is also very dynamic in that it's close enough to Monroe County. So people may want the life experience of, have, of being a little bit more rural, a little bit more suburbia, but yeah. they still have those maybe like bigger Rochester, Monroe County type of jobs. So that's always happening. I think we're always, we'll, we'll anticipate that that's going to, to continue to happen. Um, but the rural areas are very important because a lot of times you're larger enterprise, such as a Micron, such as other. So it might not necessarily be an individual driving to work every day so much as there might be employers out here in the manufacturing sector that pick up side contracts from Micron. So there's still the job will still be here. We'll still need the workers here, but the ultimate prog product will go to Micron. That's very true for upstate New York, the Finger Lakes region and beyond. There's uh, significant large uh, heavy transit, Bombardier, your large, large transit. So none of those are here, but yeah. 90 to 95 percent of the manufacturers that satisfy the pieces parts for those large, large uh, manufacturers are in upstate New York. Artificial intelligence. How can it be leveraged in the work you guys do? Um, and a net Good or negative, and not good or negative for uh, life. <laughs> <laughs> There's another tricky question. It is a tricky one. So I'm just going to cut it right smack in half. I think it's true with with anything. Uh, you know, brand new credit cards coming out and how we're going to use those. There's a positive and negative to everything. We 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 already are well aware of AI. Is is there a negative shadow side that it can be used in? Yep. Is that scary? Yep. 
Uh, that said, it's technology is moving forward, and I don't think we're going backwards anytime soon. So to that point, does it have its positive? Can it be useful? Can it be helpful? Yes. Are we using it currently? Yes. At Finger Lakes Works, uh, we do a lot of our own productions and a lot of outreach materials and stuff. And boy, oh boy, it sure is a lot easier just to punch in those you know, uh, those keywords and messages. And, and it, even if we're not using what AI came up with, we can tweak it from there. Yeah. So we're already using it. Um, uh, we had uh, one of our career offices came up and, and uh, as a tool for our community members to use, you know, click on any one of these AI and help build your resume, uh, help build your, your interview styles and techniques. Employers are using them to train and they can be customized. It's learning with you all the things that we're afraid of uh, when we're using it in a positive way, are positive. So instead of just a traditional training program, whatever that may be, whatever that may look like, with AI, it can customize to you and it will work with you until you get to a success pass point so that you move on to the next component or module. Yeah. Oh, no, it's going to take all the jobs away. <laughs> you already debunked that once, yeah. but I think it, it's worth it, talking about it again. Um, so in the near future, we are not smart enough and AI is not evolved enough yet in my sphere. It could be in other spheres. In my sure. sphere, it's not evolved enough yet. And we still need the technical people to work on that and fix it. And it's being used as a tool for training uh, and for on, on the job work that can be done. Um, in the future, you know, that's a little bit uh, sci-fi yet to come and see. <laughs> and I have no projections for any of that. Uh, last topic I wanted to talk about is it, where your uh, where your organization kind of puts its energy in terms of advocating on some of the ancillary workforce issues that we hear folks talk about, housing, mm -hmm. uh, child care. You mentioned child care already. Mm -hmm. um, those types of issues, they're not directly in the path of what you guys are, are working on in terms of generating or, or building the workforce. However, they're very part and parcel to it. So. Where do you guys spend your energy um, advocating on that front in this area? So housing is, is obviously a very big one. Um, so um, Ontario County did a significant study. They have been in to talk to our board. Uh, we have real estate agents coming in to a future board meeting to continue that conversation, the awareness piece. And it all does wrap in and tie in together. If someone is going to invest, whether it's an individual investing in their own training to gain skills or as we as a system, when somebody is eligible for training dollars, invest in that training, the outcome, that job needs to be sustainable. And that means being able to purchase a home and live here and have a life here in the Finger Lakes region. Uh, you don't want to buy a house and then be house poor and not be able to do anything. You want to have a life. So all of those conversations and dynamics come into the board when we meet. Um, uh, New York State already has, you know, we've hit a $15 minimum wage. That's going to increase to $16. But all of that plays into it and helps as all of this navigates through. There is not an easy answer, and the data and the reports tell us it's not going away soon. Things are going to continue to be difficult. That is going to be a challenge for at least the next 10 years and probably longer. There are some uh, just dynamics that need to work themselves out when you get really into the specifics of why we're having a, a housing crisis. Where can folks learn more about the Workforce Investment Board? www.fingerlakesworks.com. Lynn, thanks so much for the time.